I find that families tend to fall in love with their businesses and forget the family part or de-emphasize the family part. We say, okay, we're willing to sacrifice some things that we would be able to do individually with complete freedom when we're together. For example, where we travel to together or what we give to together or how we talk about the wealth that our business might produce together. We make those decisions jointly. So the together is the most important factor there. We spend a lot of time in our family gatherings just hearing what's going on with you or you or you. Sometimes you hear stuff and you're like, oh my gosh, these people are nuts. And they're saying that about me. They're looking at me going, you know, he's, he's the least interesting person I know. Why are we following this guy? And I mean, I've got cousins who are crazy. Everybody does. And you're listening to this now and you know who you are. And they say the same thing about me. Family in business is on a long journey together, but family systems and business realities are dynamic, constantly evolving and forever interdependent. So how do families make decisions together that serve a greater purpose? And before we even get into the decision-making part, how do families find their collective and individual purpose? Is having a purpose really a necessity? Or is it mere nice-to-have but not a must-have? And how would having a clear purpose make a difference? Hi, my name is Esther Choi, the executive producer and your host of the John L. Ward Center for Family Enterprises' own podcast series, Family in Business, a podcast that features stories of leaders, their families, and the family enterprises they transformed. Welcome to Season 2. In this season, we're putting a focus on purpose. What is it? Why bother searching for it? And what are the main benefits of having purpose? Oh, and one more thing. How do you go about finding your purpose? In this first episode, we're going to hear from someone who's done a lot of thinking about purpose. Before Chris even began to work for his family business, he started to reflect on his personal purpose. And as he and his family work through the inevitable hurdles that are set in all families in business together, their collective purpose began to emerge, even though they didn't set out from the beginning to find their purpose together. But first of all, who is Chris? My name is Chris Hershend. I'm the chairman of our family's company called Hershen Enterprises. We're in family entertainment. Basically, we own and operate things that you would do with your family on a day off or on a vacation. Theme parks, water parks, aquariums, the Harlem Globetrotters is one of our companies. So things that you would do together with your family for fun. That's us. So we've been in business together as a family since roughly 1950. The business model hasn't really changed in 71 years. We've simply done more of the same thing in more places to serve more people over that time. In the 70s, we moved from Missouri and we added a park in Tennessee. In the 80s, we added water parks in Texas and Oklahoma and Georgia. And these were all built essentially from the ground up. And then we started buying things that were already running. And in the 2000s, we were, you know, we started doing aquariums and other things like that. So pretty much the same business model, which is you pay a ticket to get in and then you buy food and merchandise while you're with us. Lots of fun over the years, getting it from you know a few thousand people to a few million. What we've done well, what we've compounded and really turned the flywheel on over the years is the way we select and retain the people that work for us. We have a few thousand employees at this point, but the steeping in our culture that takes place among the people who are with us year round is so effective. And this is no credit to me. This is our leadership team for decades is so effective at attracting the people who love to care for our guests. And so then our guests love to come back year after year. So we have hundreds of thousands of what we call season pass holders who come back multiple times a year and is pretty special. And then equally special, we have a lot of people who work for us in the summertime or for just you know nine months a year when we're in peak season in some of these parks. And they come back year after year after year. For a seasonal business at its core, it's a very stable culture. 
we know our guests and our guests know us. And of course, when you have a few million, it's not like you know everybody first name, but they hold us to a pretty high standard for um, simple things like cleanliness and safety, but also the way they feel when they're with us and the way they know they'll be able to enjoy a day with their family. And it's pretty special. Purpose is a highly complex, conceptual, and important topic to family and business. There are so many constantly evolving factors with interrelated dynamics that influence purpose. So as we begin our journey exploring purpose, we want to start with a family enterprise that has a stable corporate culture and a straightforward business model. This then allows us to focus on one thing at a time. And this one thing that we're focusing on during our first episode is how does one family manage to get to his collective purpose? Let's continue to hear from Chris about purpose, about his individual purpose, and about his family enterprise's purpose. I love the purpose question, and it's a question I've asked myself a lot and challenged myself to think through with the help of some mentors years ago. Even then, even when I had a job that wasn't working for the family, a vocational job, a day job that wasn't working for the family, I've always felt like my job was to love and serve my family. When I'm working on anything for my family, it always felt free and easy. It wasn't without conflict, but it just felt free and easy. And when you're doing something you're made to do, you tend to throw yourself into it in a way that's fun for you. You enjoy the struggle that comes with it. And that was the first place I ever saw that in myself. So there's a distinction we make between the family's purpose and the family enterprise or the company's purpose. Our business happens to say its mission is to bring families closer together, which sounds like it's perfect for a family business. Our mission is to create memories worth repeating. That's in the business. Again, feels good, but I'd say set those aside. Our family's mission, we say to each other, we want to live, love, and serve together. You know, we went through a process to come to that and we put some meat on that bone, but that's the core of it. And the together is the most important part. Wow. Here we have Chris Hershen, a family business board chair whose life purpose is to love and serve his family. His family enterprise's purpose is to create memories worth repeating for millions of families. And the family's purpose is to live, love, and serve together. I am seeing a picture of dozens of the Hershen family members holding hands over a campfire and singing Kumbaya. How much more of a picture-perfect scene can one expect from a family in business together? But is it really? My eight cousins and I, we just had a lot of distrust. And I mean, I've got cousins who are crazy. Everybody does. And they're listening to this now and you know who you are. And they say the same thing about me. Yikes, what happened? To my surprise, what seeded the distrust amongst Chris's cousin can be traced back to storytelling. Storytelling? Am I kidding? Esther Choi, a big proponent of storytelling, is saying that storytelling germinated distrust for the Hershen family? Yes, that is what I'm saying. But in this case, it is the silo kind of storytelling that was very unhelpful. In fact, telling stories in silo was flat out destructive. I'll let Chris tell you more. I think the simplest way to describe it is we all launch into life, adulthood, with certain assumptions about the way the world does work, should work. I was writing my own story about how the company or how the family ought to do or what we ought to do. And I was probably more willing to share that than another family member might have been. And this is just an example. And they might have looked at me and said, what a know-it-all, what a jerk, what an arrogant, blah, blah, blah. And there was probably some truth to all those things, probably is some truth to those things. And then I would look at them and say, well, what do they know? They haven't ever blah, 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 blah. You don't typically say those things plainly in a healthy way, in a healthy setting. You typically tell your own story and you just start spinning, right? And you've got in our case, eight cousins all spinning in our own little storytelling vortex. And we have our allies, right? Our wives or our husbands to whom we're talking or our favorite sibling. And we're telling everything to them and they're reinforcing. With family in business together, this is what storytelling in silo could look like. Within each of the extended family groups, 
individual members are raised with different assumptions about how the world works, should work. In storytelling term, the assumption is called point of view. As we look at the world and the people in it with different point of views, we have a byproduct, and this byproduct is called interpretation. In Chris's example, that's the, oh, what a jerk, what a know-it-all. Or in another situation with another family, it could be, hey, she's definitely our next board chair. The possibility of different interpretations is endless. But what happens when we tell stories in silo, but with allies who agree and reinforce our interpretations? We then come to believe our interpretation is definitely the right interpretation. And before you know it, fractures begin to take place before a family can even get to its collective purpose. So what did Chris and his family do? He'll tell us when we come back from our break. Welcome back to Family in Business. Did you know that for over two decades, the John L. Ward Center for Family Enterprises has been serving as a clearinghouse for the family enterprises community to identify resources and address specific challenges they face? That means that coming to our executive education program isn't the only way you can tap into our vast resources. In fact, you can contact us with your specific questions about your family enterprise challenges so we can identify resources to help you meet and overcome those challenges. Just write to us. The email address is familyenterprises at kellogg.northwestern.edu. That's family enterprises at kellogg.northwestern.edu. All in one word, and the email is in our show notes as well. Now, let's get back to Chris's story. How did he and his family break out of their storytelling vortex? What we try to do now, though, is we try to sort of pull ourselves out of those silos and force ourselves to tell each other our concerns or our stories in a healthy way. There's a lot of conflict that just naturally exists between any person, any two people. So we're trying to not make the conflict go away so much as to try to get it out in the open where we can work on it together. And I can think of at least three major crises in the last 20 years that I would say were trust-based that threatened to pull the family apart. They all presented with a crisis. Somebody didn't get elected to the board or somebody said they wouldn't support some big decision that seemed like the obvious decision or we had a leadership crisis in the company that we had to resolve. So whatever the situation was, we came into it disagreeing with our guns drawn. And then the way we resolved it was we had to put our guns down and sit with another person, usually not a family member of good faith to kind of pull us out. And it's never been one meeting where that just magically happens. It's always a process. And in each of those cases, I hesitate to make it sound like we tied everything up and then kind of held hands and skipped off into the distance. There were winners and losers. I think the thing that's helped our family the most is the folks who probably would be described as having lost that battle felt that they had been heard throughout the process and honored and they had a fair shot at influencing and the group decided to go a different way. The most fatal thing to getting to that point is when anybody feels like somebody just dominated the process or unfairly or unreasonably took it over. So in all three of those cases, that's the common thread. Somebody else that wasn't a family member stepped into the middle of it, helped us sort of see what we could gain by all working together, and then helped everybody sort of put things in the pot that were sacrificial and work out a compromise. Of those three instances, could you pick one that you can um, dive a little bit deeper? Like what was the issue that was contested? Why did you guys disagree? The most colorful one that I can remember is from about 10 years ago. The flare that lit up the sky that told us something was wrong was we had two family directors on our board of directors and one of them was not reelected and it surprised us. We only have two family directors. We had six or seven non-family, a majority non-family. So in a sense, you're like, well, no big deal. He's got just one fewer director. 
but it was a signal of family disharmony and disunity that everybody saw. It was kind of a branch level issue that we knew about. Oh my gosh, we'd known about it for years, right? To my point earlier, we'd all known there was a little bit of lingering here and a little bit of this and he said, and then there was that time when, and can you believe she, and you know, those kind of stories had gone on for years and finally it erupted in a way that for us was pretty concerning. And so we said, we've got to do something. Otherwise, this kind of anger and frustration doesn't really have an end game that's a good one. I had dreams at that time about, well, we should just split this thing up. Why are we dealing with this? Why do we need to put up with this? You know, my self-talk. I'm so right and they're so wrong. Why don't I just do this and do this? And I'm sure they were doing the exact same thing. And so in a sense, you've got people sort of massing their armies on the border, right? And we said, well, let's make an effort at essentially a mediation. And we'd never taken the eight cousins in my generation, five siblings on one side, three on the other. We'd never, the eight of us, just been alone. We'd done a lot of shareholder meetings for 10, 15 years at this point. We've been meeting twice a year. We had all the consulting advice. We'd done everything by the book. We had all the governance, all the paperwork, but we'd never just the eight of us with no spouses gone away and tried to address issues. So we did that. Frankly, there were more hurt feelings that almost threatened even that starting. I mean, people were hurt by what had happened and didn't want to go meet. And, you know, who wants to spend time with this person? Or, you know, that's fair. Why would I want to do this? It's a perfectly good weekend. Why do I want to go sit in a hotel room? with? But we did it anyway. And we set it up as three meetings. And the first one was, you know, most everybody would agree, perfectly pleasant, but kind of a waste of time. The second one was raw and nasty and hurtful. I compare it to that phase in the construction process where all the earth has been moved around and there's maybe some concrete pour, but there's a ton of mud on the job site. And then there's a deluge that comes through. It's just a mess. You walk through, it's messy. It's ugly. You wonder if you'll ever. That was our second meeting. And then our third meeting, and this was over the course of a few months, all facilitated with the same person in that case. And by the third meeting, it was like beautiful. And something clicked. I mean, everybody kind of looked at that second meeting and said, well, if that's the way this thing ends, it's a tragedy for all of us. So by the third meeting, there was just this willingness. I think you have to see that ugliness and you have to just come face to face with it to know if you're willing or able to get past it. And in our case, lucky us, we were. And again, it was a lot of give and take. Ultimately, we came out of that process not with everything's fine. And, you know, we all suddenly agree on everything, but really with some decisions, some pragmatic decisions that sort of gave us what I'd call peace. And we we said, we're going to do this and then this and then this and this order with respect to how we elect or who we elect. And we all agreed on it. And it really didn't make the problems go away, but it bought us time to sort of get through them without disrupting the company or upsetting the family or embarrassing somebody or shaming anybody. It was during that window of time, kind of that next two to three years of time where we healed. We just simply healed. And How long ago was that? That was a decade ago. That was about halfway into my time on the board and in the family system. So it wasn't the very first thing that hit us and it's not the most recent, but the pattern, the pattern has repeated in some ways. But I'm wondering this, the second to the third, it went from ugly to much better. But an alternative possibility could be it went from ugly to uglier. Mm -hmm. So in that instance, what factors or influences did you think was there that steered a course to better instead of worse? I remember I wrote, I uh, take a lot of notes. I was looking at my notes from that era. And what I felt like was my aha moment was I called it plexiglass. Like I was getting hurt feelings, like it was a personal criticism when somebody didn't agree with me or want to go the direction I thought we needed to go or whatever. And somebody coached me on this and just said, you know, just they need to say it. They need to be allowed to, and you need to be okay with people saying things that are potentially hurtful and divisive and ugly. Now, hopefully not personally. And not a lot of our stuff was personal, though some of it was, you know, you're an idiot, you're, you know, that kind of stuff. I really like the analogy of plexiglass. In some cases, it sounded like Chris had to use a bulletproof glass. But whatever analogy works for you, that's the idea. Now, plexiglass protected him from what must have felt like personal attacks. 
it's protective and it's a defensive move. But after that, how did he move on? What did he do to move his family forward to achieve constructive and productive results? Here, Chris will give us a very concrete example. If somebody thinks differently about, I'll just make up something, but I mean, but not just trivial stuff, important stuff like our debt ratio in the business or our approach to dividends or kind of some meaty things, I would take it personally. I was just like, why do you not trust me to, do you not think I've fill in the blank? And I just had to learn the plexiglass. And so let them fire away. And I had to learn a poker face. Don't show it on my face when I'm, you know, just let it go. And then do the right next thing. In a pragmatic example, call the question. Go ahead and say, all right, is this person had the best possible chance to share their point of view and an alternative? And if the answer is yes, and you can say that in good faith, then don't sit around and debate it all day. Call the question. Ask your family if they've had enough time to consider the alternatives and now make a decision. And then the grace on the other side of this is if that went my way, the person on the other side, this is where I think it's totally out of my control, but really a credit to my family. They would say, okay. I remember one time a cousin said, I really feel like you all would hear my point of view on this. You would go, oh, and you'd all agree. And you all heard my point of view. You all went, oh, but you didn't agree. And I have to be okay with that. Those were almost his exact words. Great credit to a person that I would not have thought would have been that way before, but it was because I was so blinded by the tugging match over, does he even have the right to express this point of view? And of course he does. Bottom line is what it looks like now in our family is if you walk into a family meeting, you may hear a lot of crazy talk, unproductive talk. And sometimes people look at me, consultants will come into our system and say, are you going to rein this? And our culture is like, no, 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 no. This is the way it needs to be. And then we'll call the question, meaning vote, make a decision. And let's abide by that decision. And what's funny is the unity around our decisions has gone up over time, not down. So you'd think having more stuff on the table and more noise in the system potentially could be a distraction that might confuse. It tends to clarify. It's pretty remarkable, given the Hirschen family's unique decision-making process, that there's this big emphasis on being together. Remember the family's purpose? That they strive to live, love, and serve together? You have to see together, not as unanimity. We're not a monolithic group. Here's an important point that many people might have taken for granted. Within a family enterprise, people are not necessarily a monolithic group. For example? An example would be faith. There are people in our family who are secular, agnostic, maybe even atheists. There are people in our family who are evangelical Christians. There's kind of everything in between. I hear a lot of families talk about, it's typically a G1 or a G2 family talk about how important faith is to their family. And by definition, faith is highly personal and it is not something you can foist on your children or you're certainly not your siblings. Another example would be parenting styles. There is not a single person on the planet who wants parenting advice from their siblings. I've heard it said, John Davis said this, parenting is the most important job in a family business. So now you've got a lot of families, I believe, that feel like maybe they can help their siblings be better parents. I've never once received parenting advice with grace from my siblings. I believe I've got it figured out and I've got the best resources and the best answers. And my brother would tell you he does and my sister would. But it's generally something that people just don't want to be told. And so I, when I hear families say, you know, faith is really important to our family or our kids are all going to have this approach to money or our kids are all going to do this with their work experience. And that kind of command and controls tends to fall apart after a generation or two. And you can't enforce it with trust. You can incentivize it with money, I guess, but people tend to feel a little bitter about that. All right. I'm following you here, Chris. Faith and parenting styles are two examples of how people in the same family system can be very different and they really can expect to influence each other and they don't want to be told what to do. So how do you stay together? And how do you stay together and strive towards a common purpose? I think that entropy is really important in order to get to the together. 
And the together is a willing sort of sacrificial statement. And you don't get there if you say, we're going to be together and sort of grind your way to togetherness. You get to together by letting people be their individual best and letting them come fully alive and celebrating those differences. I think to be together, it requires this freedom to not be together. Wait, what? Say this part one more time? I think to be together, it requires this freedom to not be together. How does that work? I need an example. We have what's called a redemption policy where you can tender your shares to the company in exchange for cash and do whatever you want. We used to have all kinds of rules that limited that. And as we dropped the rules, the frequency and discussion around redemptions also dropped, the volume dropped. So something about lowering the gates and allowing more individual freedom actually increased our sense of shared purpose. Is that true? That in order to increase the sense of shared purpose, you have to allow more individual freedom? That you have to celebrate family members for who they are and especially how different they are from each other? And that to be together, it requires this freedom to not be together. Is that true? I think it's very true. That's Professor Jennifer Pendergast, the executive director of Kellogg's Ward Center for Family Enterprises. I can invoke my mentor, John Ward. I remember saying to me early on in my career with him, which is that if you give people a window, they won't walk out the door. So the idea that people who feel like they're part of something not by choice are much less likely to be engaged than those who feel like it's a choice to be part of something. And if by a choice to be part of something, that also gives you the choice to not be part of something, right? And also then I've made a conscious decision, so I feel more invested in it because I chose it, right? So if it's sort of something that just I'm part of by birthright, I didn't choose to be part of this, but if you say, please come to this meeting, please join us, you know, we would like you to participate. Or, you know, if you decide not to be an owner of this business, that's okay. It seems counterintuitive, but actually the choice not to be part of it makes them want to be part of it. That's a lesson I learned from John. Welcome back to Family in Business, sponsored by Kellogg's Ward Center for Family Enterprises. For over 20 years, we have supported emerging and established leaders from business-owning families around the world to share the experiences, learn together, and build lifelong connections. In addition to contacting us so that we can identify specific resources that help you and your family enterprises overcome your challenges, you should also consider diving into our resources on perpetuating your family's wealth by reviewing video recordings of our past two years of wealth continuity conferences at our website. And our website is wardcenter.net. That's wardcenter.net. Now back to Chris Hershen and the family behind the Hershen Enterprises. Somehow allowing more individual freedom can increase the shared sense of purpose. Letting people be their individual best and celebrating their differences actually help bring the family together. This approach reminds me of the core intention behind many diversity and inclusion initiatives. Now, I wonder, in practical terms, how does allowing more individual freedom show up in family enterprises, like family employment or career choices? In my family branch, we never had a culture of coming to work for the business was the way you were going to live. It was always a culture of you figure out what makes you come alive and go do that. We've extended that now writ large throughout the family, but I think there's a lot of data that show that it's healthier for the individual and for the family system when young people launch out into the world with the family business as an encourager and a source of learning and encouragement versus an employment opportunity. 
I think families that do a really good job of next generation programming and development have curriculum or a track that's really about personal exploration and fulfillment. So they'll offer coaching resources to people and career exploration and support them in internships, you know, with the idea that part of the benefit that I get out of being part of this family and why I feel engaged is because I get something that's not just about the business. They're actually investing in me. We were in a conversation the other day with a group of family business leaders, and they said, we're hoping to create better humans, people who are just better people because they're part of this family, because we actually have been blessed to have this business that generates enough capital that that's part of what we can invest in. And look, if they don't come back here to lead the business, or if they don't even join the board, but they go out into the world and do good things, and we were able to facilitate doing that then that's great. And that's like a positive outcome of the fact that we're a business that's not even related to the business. That's something that they think about in terms of sort of just training good people to go out in the world and do good things. How can we use our resources to create positive human capital that we're going to spin out into the universe? I think that worked well for me and for my family, my brothers and sisters, and now for cousins and nephews and nieces and others it has allowed us to enjoy and appreciate the company. So I simplify it and I just say springboard. We want to be a springboard for you. We want to come alongside you and help launch you, but we don't want to tell you where to work or when to work or how to work. We want you to do what makes you come fully alive. I've come to believe that family businesses are the best training system in the world for just regular life. I think it's a great capital structure for a business, but frankly, private equity is a great capital structure. Public ownership can be a great capital structure. So there tends to be this talk in family business circles about how they are best. Why are they best? They're the best because they require a sense of that togetherness to form among a group of people who would otherwise not necessarily have one outside of their familial bonds. For example, I am not the king of the castle in our family business, right? I am on a team. I'm working with lots of different people who all have and deserve and need a degree of independence and their decisions need to be considered. And so I have to delay gratification sometimes. I have to think about the downstream effects of my decisions today. That's a great life lesson. I have been the recipient of a lot of coaching on how to work with other people and how to listen to other people and how to lead other people because I'm part of a family business. My kids will learn about handling personal finances in a way that is pretty important because they will have assets that right off the bat, you know, not enormous, we're not sending them the checkbook, but because of the wealth created by our family business, our kids will have some responsibility sooner than they otherwise might. That's a great learning tool, being able to make mistakes when you're young. So I just think being part of a family business, there's all this other stuff that essentially revolves around how to work with other people. And how to work with other people is this, it's what we do for our entire lives. I've had the advantage for 20 years of, you know, an accelerated class of how to work with and through and for other people that I think has served me really well. And it's, I feel so lucky to be part of a family business and to have been able to work with people who are related to me, but very different than me all these years. Indeed, not only can family enterprise be a springboard for its members, it can also be a great source for creating better humans. You may have heard of the saying, let's leave a better world to our children. Well, at least in the case of the Hirschen family, they're saying, let's leave better children to our world. Next generations are about all that any society have to invest in if they want to have a shot at securing a promising future. That's why Kellogg's War Center for Family Enterprises has set the theme Next Generation as the focus for the academic year 2021 to 2022. At the War Center's website, you'll find many tools and resources that prepare you to think about how might your family prepare your next generations for their path? How might your family be able to leave better children to our world? And finally, I've asked Chris Hershen after sharing all those stories with us, how would he best sum up his purpose? 
Here's what he has to say. I've got my wife and my children. That's my first and primary responsibility and joy. And then I've got this broader extended family, like we all do, right? And I've got, you know, 50 some odd people. And then if you step back another click, there's a few thousand people in our in the circle of people that our family serves through our ownership. And then a few million people that they serve every year. So I feel like if I can serve my family well, as defined, we can make an impact on millions of people. I just feel like this is what I'm wired for. To me, that fueled my purpose, love and serve my family. How about you? What are you wired to do? Do you know? If you don't, how can you get closer to finding it? And even if you do know, how can you be sure that what you think you're wired to do or your purpose is the right one? What indications do you rely on to affirm that? And not sure if you've noticed, but throughout this episode, I've used some terminologies interchangeably, like missions and purpose. But there are others like vision, goals, objective. What are the differences? Is there any? And if so, how so? We'll begin to answer these questions in the next episode. Thank you for tuning in to Season 2 of Family in Business, a podcast sponsored by the John L. Ward Center for Family Enterprises. Thank you, Chris Hershen, Chairman of the Board of Hershen Enterprises. Our show is supported and advised by Professor Jennifer Pendergast, Executive Director of Kellogg's Ward Center for Family Enterprises. Kane Power is our audio engineer, and I am Esther Choi, an adjunct lecturer at the Kellogg's Ward Center, founder of Leadership Story Lab, and author of the book Let the Story Do the Work. <laughs>